uh, a couple of days after our anniversary on May the 17th, we went to this house. And we liked Scotland so well, we were just taken with the Highlands. It's just beautiful. It's unexpected. It's welcoming. It's a place you're so glad you came and you hope you get to come back someday. We were having so much fun there. We thought we might make an offer on this house, but I couldn't fit in the door. So we decided that wasn't going to work out too well. But uh, not long after that little excursion in our rent car, we came back home and going down the street toward our hotel, we came across this house. We'd already been through, not this one, but the next one. This house. We've been by on a city tour, sort of like an open-air taxi to kind of show us things. They did not say a word about this house. You know whose house this is? This is the home of John Knox, the famous Reformation preacher. And uh, I was kind of sad. Well, come to find out, he is a hero in Scotland, and he's also one of the most denigrated men in Scotland. You kind of either love him or you hate him. And uh, we stopped by this house. I recognized it on our way home. Saw the sign. We were five minutes late. I couldn't go in. So we stopped next door at this little place to grab some tea and maybe a little bite to eat. And I saw a sign that there was going to be sort of a public uh, presentation of some kind of a book review type deal a little later. So I asked Terry, I said, if I come back for that, maybe I can learn something, you know, about this place of uh, very historical significance, church history. She was like, sure. So I took her back to the hotel, got her all settled in, locked in a room. I came back about 9 o'clock that night. Um, somehow I'd gotten the uh, time mixed up, I guess, because it was all over. So I just talked to the guy at the desk, and you know what? They let me by myself into the home of John Knox, and I stayed for two and a half hours. Gave myself a tour. Took lots of pictures. Saw a Geneva Bible that was printed in 1565. Unbelievable. Just a privilege to be here. I didn't really know that much about John Knox, to be honest with you, but I've tried to learn more since I returned. You know what I found out? He had a... Uh, he had a teacher um, who uh, was burned at the stake. John Knox was a young man, and uh, this man's name was George Weishart. Not sure about the pronunciation, it's W I S H A R T. And uh, Weishart was a very well loved preacher in Scotland who believed this was the problem. The Roman Church held. Uh, Control. It was almost a control thing. They were in control of men's souls. And they could literally say to you whether or not you're going to be, you know, saved or condemned after death. Well, they had, you know, a lot of people really feared that, felt manipulated by that. And uh, Weisher, under the influence of Zwingli and others, uh, Luther and Calvin, uh, Weisher was teaching that salvation comes through Christ and the only place you need to go to find out about Christ is in the scripture. And so as he taught this, he became very popular in Scotland, um, except that uh, one of the cardinals uh, arrested him. Matter of fact, John Knox was his young student, like an 18, 19-year-old kid at the time and carried with him a double-handled sword so that he could be Weishert's bodyguard, you know, to help him get from one place to the next. And one night after a, a teaching, they, they knew that Weishert was in danger of being arrested. Weishert said to uh, John Knox, he said, one sacrifice is enough. You stay with your learners. Sure enough, that night, Washer was arrested, taken before a, uh, a uh, cardinal whose name was B-E-A-T-O-N. And he was tried, he was found guilty, and in his defense, he said, I have only taught what was in the scripture. And the very
very next day, they stuffed his pockets full of gunpowder balls and sleeves full and burned him at the stake. And just before he died, here's what he said. For this cause I am sent to suffer this fire for Christ's sake. Watch my face, it shall not change color. This grim fire I fear not. John Knox is Well, after his execution, people got really angry. Uh, because they said, why? was why shirts put to the fire. There was, there was no good reason. And so they stormed the castle. You know where Cardinal Beaton was staying? At the castle of St. Andrews. The famous golf course there now. It has nothing to do with church history. But this castle, if I've got a picture of you right here, um, was stormed 28 days later by a bunch of angry men. And... Uh, they not only took the life of the cardinal, but they also uh, held the castle for a long time. And, uh, the British tried to put a siege around the castle and get it back. They could not do it. The castle was well stocked with gunpowder and with, uh, with uh, food. And so they were able to stay for a long time. They finally had a truce and allowed the people who were in the castle to come and go until the next spring. And one morning, to their dismay, the people in the castle looked out from the walls and saw in the water nearby 21 gallons from France. Now, France was loyal to the Roman Church. English, uh, England was kind of trying to decide which way they were going to go. During this time, Scotland was leaning toward the Reformation. So here comes the galleys from France, and they... Uh, began to bombard the castle. They really weren't getting anywhere, so they unloaded a bunch of um, a bunch of soldiers with cannons, and they drug those cannons up very near to the wall of the castle. And they were able to make a huge breach in the wall. And the soldiers went straight through. They, they knew it was over. And people inside, it was just a matter of everybody getting arrested. The aristocrats and the noblemen sort of got a cushy sentence, and the lowest people in rank were assigned to become slaves in the galley. If you've seen the movie Lake Rob, where Jean Valjean was in the galley, you know, uh, rowing those huge boats. A typical galley had about uh, 300 slaves pushing the oars. Six men to an oar, 25 on each side. And up and down the middle was uh, someone who was yelling and screaming at them and whipping them if they weren't, uh, you know, pushing the oar sufficiently. Not only that, but they tried to force these men to convert to Catholicism. Uh, they uh, made them one time uh, on the surface or on the deck of the ship to amuse themselves. The officers told Knox and the other Scotsmen, the Highlanders, told them to uh, kiss this statue that was painted of Mary. It was an idol. That's all it was. They, they were asking them to commit idolatry, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know what John Knox did? When it came his turn, he took that idol he considered it to be, that statuette of Mary painted, and he threw it in the ocean. He said, let her see if she can swim. She's not very heavy. Maybe she can save herself. Of course, you would think after that that John Knox would have been you know, severely beaten and punished, but he was not. In fact, because of his courage, they never once again tried to proselytize her and make her become God. Not long after that, John Knox got so sick that his uh, men surrounding him thought that he was surely going to die. And he didn't think he was going to die, but they did. And uh, one day, James Balfour lifted him up and let him look out the boat because they had parked the boat the second time near uh, St. Andrews. 
two trips they made to Scotland while he was in the gallery. And they said, John, do you recognize this place? Because this was his hometown. And he looked out that boat and he said, yes, I do. He said, I see the, the steeple of the St. Andrew's Church and that's the place where God first opened my mouth to preach for His glory. And he said, you may think that I'm not well and that I'm weak, but I declare it to you that before I die, I will preach to the glory of God again in that very same church. And he did. Another story, but he did. Do you know that uh, while I was in the hospital since then, I've had nurse practitioners and nurses, healthcare heroes, one of them sitting out here this morning, here at the Corral of God, I want to love you so much, I appreciate what you did today while I was in the hospital. I mean, I had healthcare heroes around me, and uh, some of them told me that I was a hair breath my man. I called my wife one day and I texted her and I said, no, be sure and uh, write down my, uh, you know, my uh, password to our uh, savings account here in Fidelity. I'd encourage you to hang on to it just like it is to at least 2030. She, she answered me back like, why are you telling me this? Uh, I didn't feel like I was going to die, but, you know, people were telling me I might take the bus. And um, it's kind of scary, you know, I'll be honest with you. But I never really felt fearful. And then you know what happened to me this week? The most wonderful thing. I got a text from Carl Tubman, who is the uh, assistant chairman of our building. 